Kia ora, hello and welcome to a new season and episode of Play Notes, the podcast where we give you the lowdown on the plays and playwrights you need to know. I'm your host, Emily Duncan. And I'm your other host, Alison Horsley. We are both dramaturgs, aka script advisors, aka story consultants, drama demons, narrative nerds, story sallies. Uh, take your pick. Oh, I, <laughs> I thought you were going to say something with a T. T-, t. Take it. Oh, I don't have anything off the top of my head. That's terrible. That's okay. Have well, actually, terrible starts with a T. Terrible. There were lots of the terribles. We're the Russian terrible culture. tellers. That's very true. We're here to tell you about it this time. Yeah. So, Emily Duncan, what play are we focusing on this Today, time? Today, in episode two, season two of Play Notes, we are following on from the salty side eye play from episode one. You have to go back to hear what that was. Yes. Uh, we're now doing the big tree play, as I call it. <laughs> Uncle Vanya, scenes from a country life. Yes. And they are scenes from a country life. We're now, we're out in bucolic land now. Were we not bucolic in the salty side I play? Actually, we, yeah, we were, but like, I don't know, this to me feels more foresty. Okay. So. We're going deeper into the forest. Yeah. Yeah. Because like you said, it's the big tree play. It's given big tree energy. <laughs> <laughs> so in uh, episode one. We talked about how he he took a risk with the seagull. He being Chekhov. Yes. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, yeah. Who Chekhov? Chekhov. Anton. Yes. Anton. This play was written by Anton Pavlovich yeah. Chekhov. The playwright you need to know. Yes. Yes. So he took a big risk with writing the seagull, and we talked about the context of that. And first of all, the play bombed, and then uh, Stanislavski and. Uh, Nimirovich, have I said his name correctly? Pretty close. Yeah, yeah Alison's the expert on all things pronunciation <laughs> and names. <laughs> they twisted his arm to allow them to do a remount of the seagull. Yes. For the Moscow Art Theatre. Because they felt like it was it was emblematic yes. in more ways than one. Yes. Of what, they just did of, it for the logo. Yeah, yeah. They were like, they we just we need logo. something with a bird. You have to go we, back and listen to episode one if you're wondering what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, but it was it was the type of play they wanted to do, and they felt like they could create the kind of theater they wanted to create using that play, and they did. They did. It was yeah. a great success. Yeah. So at the time he's uh, writing Uncle Vanya, life is relatively pretty good for someone who's got tuberculosis, is working full time as a doctor, mm -hmm. and is still trying to write and run an estate. Yeah. What more could you ask for? Yeah, it's not so bad. I mean, he's living there with his family, like yes. his sister, his mother. The, the same people he's still supporting. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and this time he's living uh, on an estate called Milikovo, which is still in existence, actually. It looks very pretty. It is very pretty. Um, it came close to not existing thanks to the Luftwaffe. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but it was. it's still there. It's still there, and you can see the little... I'm going to call it a hut, which is yeah. the where he wrote Seagull yeah. and Uncle Vanya. Yeah, it was a, it was a guest house, right? Guest supposedly, house. Yes. okay, yes. <laughs> could you? There's a we lot could of, call it a sleep out. <laughs> well, I wondered if there's lots of references in Russian literature to summer houses. Oh yeah, yeah. Could you call it a summer house, or is it not quite? <sighs> yeah, kind of. I mean, so so in Russia, like you you see the word dacha show up mm -hmm. a bunch. Okay, so in Russia, we didn't mean to go into real estate, but here we are. That's okay. Look, what what isn't real estate at the end of the day? Yes. Um, but yeah, dachas. So like, it can be anything from like a, a shack with no running water, but okay. somebody has like a little veggie garden outside it. Right. It's it's just like a batch or a crib. Mm -hmm. It's just like that. Off grid. Yeah, it could it could be off grid like oh my god, it could be like a dock you know, hut. Yeah, it could be like a hut. New Zealand. Yeah, exactly. It it could be like a hut or it could be like an okay house. Right. You know, like so it doesn't necessarily mean fancy country summer house. Okay. It could just be like oh god, I have to get out of this flaming hot city. Um, let's go into the country and like spend a few months, you know, living off grid and growing our own veggies, and then go back into the city and you know pick things back up again so but with Milikovo it was it seems like it was a beautiful place like and he was able to be a country doctor and treat people and he garden and stuff like that he so. loved his trees and if, if you go through and read his plays closely you could see he's very sp specific mm -hmm. about the types of trees you know there, there's an elm here there's some poplars there there's yeah, yeah, it's very carefully thought out. Yeah, and actually I was just thinking, you know, the American player at O'Neill does the same thing. Mm -hmm. He's really into the trees too. I just mm -hmm. thought of that. Okay. So Vanya, 
Uh, so, uh, and, and the Russian for this is Dzeja Vanya, uh, Uncle Vanya, mm -hmm. is what that is. Um, and in this case, Vanya is a nickname. Um, we talked about in the last episode, we talked a little about names. Yes. Um, and so this character, his name is Ivan, um, but his nickname is Vanya. So yeah. that's why he's Uncle Vanya. Do we know why, oh no, just do this with another play. It stands out, you know, when he, he names a particular play, given the size of oh, the cast, yeah, yeah. after a particular character. Right, yeah. Yeah, it is unusual because the only person who refers to him as Uncle Vanya in the play is his niece, Sonia. Mm -hmm. You know, so that is kind of interesting. Nobody else, it's not like everybody in the play refers to him as Uncle Vanya. I mean, a couple people do, but usually that's within the context of Sonia somehow. Right. And there was an earlier play that this was largely based on called The Wood Demon. Mm -hmm. um, which which has a bit of a different vibe to it, and we won't we won't really talk about that, but but folks can go back and read that too. Uh, but in that case, the wood demon refers to Astroff, who's the doctor. Who's the doctor? Who's, yeah, who's a whole ass other character. Yes. So it's interesting that like he still wants to name this play after somebody, um, but it it changes who it's named after. And there's you know? always doctors in his plays. Yeah, there's like always some sort of doctor hanger on. And Even though they're the three drinker. sisters, they don't show. We yeah, don't actually see the doctor, but he's talked about. Well, he's a military doctor. Chebutikin mm -hmm. is a military doctor. <gasps> oh, but he's like not really practicing. Right, he's just sort of there hanging out, being okay. old. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's his jam. <laughs> so when I first read that he was living on an estate, yeah, I thought, my God, is he loaded? But you said, no, no, it's not like that. It's not that sort of thing. It, yeah, he's not super, super, super loaded. I mean, definitely comfortable enough, mm -hmm. um, but not like the, the type of wealth that was going on in Russia at the time. I mean, it like it was it was beyond it, it was like the one percent having I don't know. It's like it's it's the kind of wealth that we think of now with people having like super yachts and just cra crazy 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 amounts of money. That's the kind of money that existed in Russia at the time. It's people having like multiple palaces, multiple homes. Um, and yeah. Stanislavski, who we <laughs> yeah. last speaking like, of super rich, <laughs> so he yeah. was really comfortable. Yeah, Stanislavski, the director, even though we, we associate him with realism and stuff like that, and maybe like more of a grotty kind of thing, he was, Stanislavski was not his real name. His real name was Alexeyev, um, which is a really, it was a wealthy family in Russia. So and when he, he needed to go away and think, he got to go away and think in a very nice summer house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and actually, and Chekhov always referred to him as Alexeyev. Like as as a little bit of a dig or like a little bit of a reminder, mm -hmm. um, but Stanislavski picked the the uh, the stage name Stanislavski a to make himself sound more quote unquote Polish um, to distance himself from his family, um, but also so that they wouldn't be embarrassed of him because he was a performer. Okay, um, but yeah, uh, so interestingly, but but yeah, Chekhov always just referred to him as Alexeyev, right? Which but is like oh. Snap, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, yeah. Now, on these certain terms that get um, we meet in the play, mm -hmm. and I think now could be a good time to sort of explain them a bit more. For yeah. example, there's often references to Watchmen and Watchmen yeah. tapping. Yeah, so that's something that comes up in Uncle Vanya and then also in Cherry Orchard too, mm -hmm. particularly in Cherry Orchard. Um, so, uh, yeah, and in Seagull also actually, because the dogs are barking. Anyway, yeah. So anyway, uh, so yeah, at this time, um, it, it, Russia still had a lot of country estates um, that had been impacted by the liberation of the serfs in 1861. Um, the estates were still there, but they didn't have serfs mandatorily working on them. So the whole system was starting to change a bit, um, but there were still these vestiges of this old feudal system. So one of the vestiges of that uh, are the watchmen. So a watchman would often be employed by the, the estate um, to tap. And it was a way of like, of loudly tapping something outside. And it was a way of showing people who might be thinking about coming and robbing the estate, that there was a watchman on site. Um, and also it would tell the people in the house, they're like, all is well. The watchman's right. out there, they're doing the tapping. Okay. And I was reading somewhere, somebody had said, some smarter person than me was like saying, you know, it's it's reminiscent of a prison in a way. That like the people are inside the house and there's this like guard outside, you know, like this tapping. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Banging against the bars. Yeah, but it, it shows up quite a few times. And, and Chekhov was 
one of the aspects of realism that Chekhov would infuse his plays with was this type of, of oral kind of yeah. these, these noises coming in to, to give a sense of the life of the world. The sort of expanded yeah. world or universe. And, and, and in the fourth play we're going to talk about. Oh, yeah. And Cherry Orchard really shows up. Hardcore. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and but in Vanya, you, it's the tapping periodically that just reminds you that there's somebody outside of this little insular world who's like just outside. We're um, going to meet Kulex uh, further on, but I think we should, yeah, as Tim's characters. But can we just sort of touch on that briefly now? Yeah. So the word Kulak was a um, was actually a negative. It had a negative con connotation. Uh, Kulak in Russian is like a fist, like a clenched fist. Um, and so those were the people who generally were like more of a middle class person um, or who were viewed as being a peasant who had risen up and who was now hoarding resources. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, some of them maybe formerly were serfs? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Former serfs or, yeah, people who had somehow cobbled together, cobbled together enough of a living that they were able to, to now be kind of middle class. Mm -hmm. um, and so it connotes some level of upward mobility. Um, but also of of a of a getting by as best you can, and that that shows up with Lapakin in Cherry Orchard. Right. People call him a kulak, and he kind of he's he's a little embarrassed of it, but he also wears it kind of proudly. Um, so it's this time in Russia where where there's this shifting economic and social construct, really, like things are just falling apart because mm. they, they were not the way they had been in the past. Right. Um, so, yeah, so there were still people who were former serfs and and you see in Uncle Vanya, you know, it's this it's it's a working estate, you know, like Vanya and Sonia have been like working on this property and sending money to Sarah Byakov, who's uh, the, it's the one of the sources of tension. Yeah. They have to keep things ticking over all the time, uh -huh. um, whereas some of the others sort of just waltzed in for a bit of a yeah. A holiday and a kickback. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's it would it's not unlike the idea of going out to somebody's farm today and being like, oh, it's so bucolic. Look, there's sheep. It's so pretty. You know, the people who are there I'm gonna working. I'm going to sleep until 10. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. And the people who are there working are like, hi, this is our living. We work really hard. You know, but for folks who aren't used to it, it's it's luxury. Or right. So this play definitely shows that. When they lot. do get to relax. Mm hmm <laughs> uh, we often hear mention of samovars. Yes, you can't you can't talk about Russian stuff without talking about samovar. Um, so the word samovar means self heating, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a it's like a metal contraption that's usually really beautiful uh, with a central cylinder that you can put coal in, and it keeps your tea warm. Uh, so it's a so without having to plug it in or whatever. So it's it's constantly when you get going it keeps a teapot that's on the very top hot uh -huh. um, and then you can pour extra water out mm -hmm. of like a, a little spigot thing toward the bottom of the tank uh, and you see them you see them around you can find them in op shops and stuff um, but yeah that's uh, when I first went to Russia in 1997 like my, my friend and I joked that I was gonna, gonna buy a samovar and that was gonna be like the only thing that came back in my suitcase was because, because that's what you do in Russia is you like have a samovar so right. anyway um, so the samovar and do people still use them today um not Different. that I've seen I'm sure they still have them though mm -hmm. I mean but I think the electric kettle has you know Video killed the radio star. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, I have I have a little tiny samovar in my house actually that oh, a friend of mine gave me. But like I a think travel samovar. Is it, yes, <laughs> but it's, it's chips of coal. In it's it. mostly ornamental though, and I actually dropped it so it's like now slanted and on an angle, so it looks like a Disney. It looks like it's it's a Disney character in right. like Beauty and the Beauty Beast. Beast. Yes. <laughs> Anyway, also give us a plot summary, a quick plot summary of what actually happens in Uncle Vanya. Okay, so um, so the play begins where uh, Sarah Byakov, who is a an academic, and I say this as a former academic, a professor. He is a professor. A professor. Yes, he is the stereotypical professor. Uh, he has just arrived back um, on the estate, which he technically where he doesn't lift a finger. Where he doesn't lift a finger. His daughter technically owns the estate, um, and that his daughter's name Sonia. He's just arrived back with his much younger wife who's like 27. So Vanya is his brother-in-law from his first marriage. Yes. Yes. So picture a family tree. Picture a family tree. <laughs> <laughs> picture a family tree where yeah, Sarah Byakov had been married to a woman. She gave birth to Sonia. 
Serebikov's ex-wife, who's a late wife, her brother was Vanya. Um, Vanya and uh, dad, Vanya's mother lives on the Vanya's estate. Vanya's well. mother lives on the estate and really is a huge fan of Serebikov, right? She was really into her her daughter's husband, like thinking he's the smartest thing ever. So all she does is sit around and like read pamphlets that this guy's written. Um, so so he Serebikov has been living away from the estate, but he has kind of like a fan club there still on the estate. So he's just come back with his much younger wife named Yelena, um, which is the Russian Helen, right? So like famously beautiful. beautiful. Exactly. So Yelena has come back. And, and since they have been back on the estate, it's thrown everything off. And Vanya is like, I don't work anymore. All I do is just like sit around and drink and we drink tea and we don't do anything. Um, so he and Sonia have not been doing the kind of work on the estate that they had done before. Meanwhile, there's Astrov, who is the, the local doctor, who is kind of drinking buddies with Vanya, and Sonia is madly in love with Astrov. Or at least she thinks she is, right? She's like, he's that guy who's like unattainable. Mm -hmm. You know, he's like a bit of a heavier drinker, a bit of a bad boy, a bit of a bit of an attractive guy, you an know, eco warrior. He's an, and he's an eco warrior. He's a, he's a vegetarian, you know, so like he's got all the stuff going on. So Astrov keeps like dropping by often to help take care of Serebiakov because he has these health issues. But who also will sort of request him to come. Oh yeah. And take care of it. But then he doesn't want to see him. No, no. He'll ask for, he'll ask he's for really Astrov. He's ass like that. Yeah. I think he just what? is really, he's, he's high maintenance. Yeah. He just wants the attention and the pity. Yeah. Uh, so Astrov will like come and, and this is not like a quick hour long stay. I mean, in Russia at the time, it's like you, you come and you stay the night mm -hmm. because it's taking so long to get there. So Astrov is coming and going. Um, meanwhile, of course, Astrov has noticed how hot Yelena is as well. But of course, Sonia is like, oh, damn, I'm not hot. Uh, you know, but hey, Yelena, now that we're getting along better, um, will you ask Astrov what he thinks of me? You know, and of course, uh, Yelena talks to Astrov, and Astrov is like, "You like me, don't you, hot lady?" And it's this hilarious moment where he gets the wrong impression. So anyway, and Vanya walks in, and Vanya walks moment. in, and meanwhile, Vanya is also in love with Yelena because everybody's in love with Yelena. Uh, so Vanya gets the wrong idea also, uh, and everybody's upset. Um, so then the professor is like, "Hey, you guys, I have a great solution. I have an idea. I'm going to sell the estate." Um, and we're going to go and move to Finland and it's all going to be fine. And Vanya is like, without consulting anyone, without consulting so I've, I've anyone, made this decision. Yeah. Yeah. And also, yeah. And, and the, we that he's talking about are he and Yelena. Um, he's not talking about like Vanya or his, or his aged mother or Marina, who's like 150 years old, who lives there on the estate also. Uh, so Vanya loses his shit and he gets the gun out and he starts firing and misses every time. Um, at close range. Um, so, it, and this is one of the checkoff plays where there, nobody actually dies. That's right. the wonderful thing. Nobody, he doesn't, nobody suicides, nothing like that. Um, but it's like tragic and comic at the same time that Vanya is like trying to shoot at Serebyakov. Because like, of course, as an audience, you're kind of like, oh no, don't hit him. But Serebyakov is also like obnoxious. So you're like, kill him, please, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but he misses. So, he misses, and then uh, and Yelena is like, I can't handle this. We have to get out of here. And then they decide that they're going to move away. And so she and Serebikov go away. Astrov promises that he's going to stay away and not break Sonia's heart, even though he's like, okay, I'll be back next year. Thanks, everybody. And everything just like resets as it was. And the play ends with this beautiful speech where, um, where Sonia says, you know, oh, uncle, you know, one day we'll rest. It'll it'll all be fine. She has this beautiful speech, and they are going back to work basically. And in this beautiful production that had happened at the Moscow Art Theater that I saw, um, the 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 last image that you see on stage is of Sonia and Vanya inside the house, and it's like you know they've got the lamp going, and outside it's just getting darker and darker right. and darker. And the worker, it's Yefim, like a zooming in effect. Yeah, it's like a zooming in effect. And the worker, Yefim, who's just this dude who's like the handyman guy or whatever, uh, Yefim closes the the window shutters on them, but then sits just outside the window, like just sort of against the house. And you have this momentary sense that like maybe he could be in love with Sonia a little bit, or something, or maybe it's gonna be okay. 
But it was just this amazing, moving thing mm-hmm. that I had never seen reading the play. It was just in the production that brought it out. But you get the sense that the house is now being closed back up for winter, and now we hibernate again. You know, and then, I don't know, maybe next year the, the same, same thing. thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, and, and Astroff won't leave again. Yeah, yeah, exa- yeah. Astroff is there, keep drinking. Yeah, so... um. Which is my, my trope of the chap, not my trope, but I call it the chap who never leaves. Oh, yeah, totally. Uh, and there's always one in a yeah. Chekhov play. Yeah, and in this play, there's also Waffles, That's um, right. who's a neighbor who um, it, it, like talks about and he's named Waffles or his nickname is Waffles because he has a pockmarked face. Um, and that's literally like what it is in Russian is waffles. Uh, so he, um, yeah, he's hanging around also. There's just, the people, they're just hangers on. Yeah. And waffles, it like feels superior because uh, the day after he got married, his wife ran off with her boyfriend and he's still supporting them mm-hmm. <laughs> financially. <laughs> <laughs> and Waffles is like, that's right, I'm a good this man. This is moral up you know? ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, except then he's like, well, yeah, but now the dude, now the dude died. So, ha, <laughs> who's laughing now? <laughs> you know, so it's this dark, weird thing. But anyway, so Uncle Vanya, uh, Uncle Vanya gives us the trope of the chap who doesn't leave. Uh, but it also potentially gives us the trope of people just sitting around and talking and being boring, um, which is is an overwhelming a stereotype of Chekhov's plays, that people just talk and they don't do anything. Um, I would say it probably comes from this play. Because, okay. because that's what they're complaining about, is they're actually like, I'm so bored. You know, and to me, this is like a this is like a lockdown play, you know. Oh, yeah. And so yeah. it's like, so the pressure that the people start to feel with each other and the angst and the anxiety and the nitpickiness mm-hmm. and the like, you know, get out of my face and I love you. But get out of my face now. It's the <laughs> shining at summer. It, it totally is. Yeah, like if I were to do an adaptation of this, I, I would call it cabin fever. Now, speaking of adaptations. Oh, yeah. Yes, because we didn't really discuss this that much. Um, right. The first episode. Right. Well, one of the reasons you're such an expert on Chekhov, Alison, is because you've translated the plays. I have translated the plays. I have translated... Um, all five of the all, all five the of length? Chekhov's yeah full length plays so uh, Ivanov Seagull, uh, Vanya Three Sisters and Cherry Orchard mm-hmm. and and a couple of them twice <laughs> so um, so Seagull and Cherry Orchard are the ones that I've translated twice right for for different purposes so I've done literal translations and then um, a couple different playwrights so uh, Libby Apple. Mm-hmm. And I worked together to do uh, the five Chekhovs, which are published under the name Five Chekhov Plays. Uh, and then I also worked with Stephen Karam on his Cherry Orchard, uh, which was on Broadway. And then his Seagull, which w- was made into a movie with Annette Benning in it. And Alison is also the co-author of the book Writing Adaptations and Translations for the Stage with Jacqueline Goldfinger. And that is published by... Routledge. Routledge. You say Routledge? Yes. Yeah. Or I don't know, people may say Routledge as well. I'm not sure. But yeah, but so yeah. I've been so I've been kind of sitting in this like translation kind of space uh for a while. And I feel like and it's so it's so broad. Translation and adaptation as ideas are so broad. And every translator I've worked with or every adapter I've worked with, we've worked out a different terminology for what we're gonna say each of us did. Mm-hmm. I think with um uh, the Chekhov's use the term versions as opposed yeah. to translations at one point. Yeah, yeah. So Libby Libby didn't like the idea of the word adaptation. She felt like that suggests that the plays are being set on Mars or something. Okay. You know, and a I significant was like, reworking. Yeah, yeah. And and I was like, well, but I'm doing a, a translation of it. You know, she's like, but mine is a translation of it. And I'm like, yeah, but it, it's a but it's a different type of translation. So we settled on version. Mm-hmm. So they're her versions. For Stephen Karam, it's an adaptation, I think. Um, yeah. So, but, but uh, all of Chekhov's plays, I think, lend themselves to adaptation in one way or another. And, uh, and Uncle Vanya is one that, uh, Vanya on 42nd Street yes. is a very famous adaptation. And we, and we talked about, um, the system and the method, mm-hmm. uh, in episode one of this season. And I think Vanya on 42nd Street is a good film to watch to maybe get a sense of, the method, approach, and action, because mm-hmm. it isn't a, a finished, complete 
right. production. Yeah, it's a, it's a process. It's, yeah, it's something in process very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's it's uh, representational as opposed to presentational. Right, which is kind of cool. And you were telling me about another production you saw oh yeah uh, Annie Baker's adaptation in New York City yeah so Annie Baker did an adaptation um also based on a literal translation that they did at Soho Rep like god probably I want to say it was in the 2010s somewhere um but anyway but it was it was an incredible production because they set it in um it was set with carpeted risers and you felt like you felt like you were in somebody's rec room it mm -hmm. felt like somebody's rec room in the 1970s or something and the audience was sitting on like pillows and stuff on carpet and you felt the claustrophobia of the characters on stage and and the actor playing yelena is uh was maria dizia who's a fantastic new york actress and she she moved like a lazy cat like in the best possible way. You could just see that she was over it. Mm -hmm. She was over all of it, you know, and, you know, without much makeup on, but still really beautiful, you know, and you can, it just, you could it's feel. It's and action. Yeah, yes, exactly, yes. And, uh, yeah, and Merritt Weaver was in it too. She was the one who was oh, playing yes. Sonia. Yes, yes, yes. And she was from Nurse Jackie. Yes, and she was fantastic. She's so good. But there was something about what they captured in terms of the immediacy and also the claustrophobia and the modernity of it that that, that version in particular lends itself to. Right. Um, and Annie Baker had done the costumes too, which is like kind of funny. Wow. Yeah, yeah, and they were they were like seventies ish. Mm -hmm. It was it was interesting, but there's something. But yeah, these plays are quite flexible, um, and and I think you uh, to some extent you kind of have to do that. I think to make them work in in America or New Zealand to some extent because our context is just different, you know. And with most of these plays, they want to be retranslated every five years or so anyway, uh, just because the, our terminology changes, our sensibility changes. So we always finish with a favorite bit. Oh, yes. Okay. I'm looking through my notes. While I look through my notes, you can go ahead and... What's Do you yours? want me to go first? Yes. Okay. So in Act 1, uh, Astroff delivers these long, beautiful speeches. And I mean, they genuinely are about uh, trees and forests. And then um, Sonia pipes in with her one. And then... Vanya just cuts through it and says, that's all very nice, but I'm not convinced. So permit me, my friend, to continue to heat my stove with firewood. And it's just like, ksh, undercut. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And there's something about, yeah, it's, it's, it's the cutting, it's the undercutting of the romanticism, mm -hmm. you know, that like Astroff is, yeah, going off and Vanya's like, I don't have time for your shit. Yeah, 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 you know, yeah. Even though it's not shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Save the environment. Yeah. But uh, yeah, no, I think my favorite part is um, there's, there's a moment where Yelena is complaining to Sonia about how bored she is and how she has nothing to do. And Sonia, being aware of what is necessary on the farm. Left a finger, lady. Yeah, Sonia's like, well, you could do this. You could teach the peasants. You could do this. You could do that. You could do that. And Yelena's like, well, I don't know how to do that. And I don't want to do that. I'm bored. <laughs> it's just like, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> So that is a favorite part of the play. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, so we're going to tackle two plays in our uh, final check-off. We are. Yeah. So come back and see us for it. You hear? <laughs>